Hello, everybody. Welcome. My name is Connor Deschmaker, and I am the uh, membership and volunteer manager here at uh, AIA Seattle. Uh, how many of you, it's your first time at the Center for Architecture and Design? Awesome. I'm always so grateful that uh, the Committee on Homelessness is able to bring so many folks who haven't been to our space before. So, welcome. Uh, first, I want to acknowledge uh, that we're on unceded uh, Duwamish and Coast Salish people's land. That's uh, an important foundation upon which uh, we must be operating at all times. Uh, this space um, is relatively recent creation. Um, it is a multi-use space. Um, in the front of the space, we host programs uh, that focus on uh, design and the broader community. And then uh, just behind the wall to my right, uh, we've got offices for AIA Seattle, the Professional Organization of Architects, uh, Design in Public, which is sort of our public-facing nonprofit. They put together the uh, annual Seattle Design Festival and other programs of the like. Uh, the Seattle Architecture Foundation, which works on sort of public education around architecture and his, uh, historic architecture. Uh, and the AIA Washington Council, which works on state-level advocacy um, on behalf of the design professions. <coughs> I want to talk a little bit um, about some upcoming programs that we have. If you're interested in continuing uh, the conversations that are started tonight. Uh, our Housing Design Forum, uh, obviously an issue close to uh, many of our hearts uh, in this group specifically. Uh, it's going to be happening on May 20th at Seattle Art Museum. Uh, we're very uh, privileged to be uh, joined by some of the folks who helped pass uh, some major zoning changes um, in uh, the Twin Cities area in Minnesota. Uh, so we're going to be learning from them about how to um, increase housing equity um, in the Seattle area. Uh, on April 24th, uh, in honor of Earth Day, we're going to be hosting a, a sustainability slam uh, in partnership with our Committee on the Environment. That's going to be just a few blocks down Western Avenue uh, at the Friends of the Waterfront space. Also on uh, the 24th, um, for any um, associate architects that are in the process of becoming licensed, uh, we're going to be hosting a, uh, an ARE study session that night as well uh, at the center. And then additionally, uh, focusing on the single-family zoning issue that certainly is, uh, has an effect on homelessness, uh, our Urban Design Forum will be hosting a panel on Neighborhoods for All uh, on April 25th here at the Center. And then uh, our annual celebration of our members uh, and our committees that make all of our uh, events happen uh, is happening on May 7th. Uh, it's called The Party, and it'll also be here uh, come Monday to attend. Um, as I mentioned, we're in the Center for Architecture and Design. Um, if you haven't already, make sure to take a look around the space. Uh, about three times a year, uh, we rotate exhibitions. Uh, the current one up right now um, is our annual travel scholarship recipient. Uh, the focus of this exhibit is because it rains and focusing on the ways that different um, societies around the globe uh, deal with rain. Um, and as I mentioned, um, all this is made possible uh, because of uh, being a membership organization. Um, we are the fifth largest chapter of the American Institute of Architects uh, in North America, uh, so we're very privileged to have a just large and broad design community, uh, and we have about 20 different member committees that uh, make all of our public programming happen and show the role that architects can and must have in society at large. The committee that put together tonight's the Committee on Homelessness uh, is a really recent creation, um, and we always want to be uh, responding to the ways the public sees uh, design profession and utilize its services um, in our community. Uh, without further ado, I want to introduce the Committee on Homelessness co-chair, Anton Deckham, um, who will give a few announcements and then introduce our speaker tonight, uh, Marty Hartman from uh, Mary's Place. Thank you all so much. Hello, uh, my name is Anton. Uh, I co-chair the Committee on Homelessness here at AIA. Uh, this is the third lecture uh, in a series of lectures that we've been doing. Uh, we also had uh, Rex Holbein from Real Change, or sorry, Facing Homelessness, uh, come in and talk last month, and then uh, Tim Harris from Real Change uh, back in February. So those two lectures, if you missed them, are on YouTube. Uh, we have a YouTube channel. Uh, you can find that either right on YouTube or through our Facebook. Um, so if you missed those, feel free to check those out. Um, let's see what else. Uh, we also have some upcoming events. Uh, we are screening Trickle Downtown, which is a movie about homelessness um, that was created here in Seattle. Uh, the director, Thomas Birnaki, is going to give a little talk about the film uh, before the screening. Uh, that's on May 22nd. Um, and then on May 13th, uh, we're hosting uh, Daniel Simons of David Baker Architects. Um, they do a lot of affordable housing, really, really nice affordable housing. Uh, so we're excited to have them. Um, 
So if you're interested in any of that or you just like more information, um, we have a newsletter if you just put your email and the sign in in the back uh, or come find me afterwards. And I wrote a little introduction for Marty and for Mary's Place. Uh, Mary's Place was established in 1999 as a day center for women experiencing homelessness. Today, Mary's Place has grown to include not only a women's day center in downtown Seattle, but also nine emergency shelters throughout King County. In addition to providing over 600 overnight beds, Mary's Place has become an indispensable resource where women and their families can find meals, showers, laundry facilities, and a sense of community. Marty Hartman is the executive director of Mary's Place and has 19 years of experience working with homeless families in King County. And according to my Google searches, uh, is also frequently listed as one of the most influential women in Seattle. <laughs> uh, Liz McDaniel uh, was listed on the event poster but couldn't be here tonight um, because she's busy doing the work of Mary's Place. Uh, but she's the director of operations um, and oversees development of their shelters. Um, so I'm sure her work would be of particular interest to the architects in the room tonight. Um, the passion that uh, Marty and Liz and all the folks at Mary's Place bring to this cause is truly an inspiration. And so I ask that you all join me in welcoming Marty here tonight. Thank you all. It's an honor to be here uh, and to share about Mary's Place, but really to answer questions that you might have and to share more about the model that we use of going into underutilized buildings and then calling them home for now. So, um, but nobody talks about our services better than our families and our kids. So I'm gonna show you a little video to get started and then um, I'll share some more. What would you tell people about why no kids should have to sleep outside? Because it's cold. We sleep in, in the airport, in the parks, got my kids and they miss in the school too and it's hard. Every morning we had to go to like public restrooms to brush our teeth or you know change our clothes which was a heartbreaking experience. It's hard to talk about sometimes um so we would call places they would have room for women and children. And my husband, God bless his heart, I'll sleep in the car and you guys go. And we're like, we don't want to divide our family. Our city is in a crisis. Our crisis is homelessness. The number of children outside has been growing exponentially in this community. And it doesn't have to be that way. Our goal at Mary's Place is to make sure that our children feel safe, loved, and invited in. And you can only do that when you bring the entire family in together. My favorite part in Mary's Place, I have my own bed and, and I have my own blanket. They help people get off of the streets so they don't have um, people suffering. And then when the people get in there, they get help getting into um, housing. They make sure you're clean and your clothes are clean. They would also help my mom out very much by letting us be in kids club. Sometimes after school, like after school we'll go and then the staff will help us do homework. I really enjoy the staff and what they do for your kids and parents and people who need someone to talk to. They give you a room, they give you shelter, they, they take good care of you. Our goal at Mary's Place is to have families move into permanent housing as quickly as possible. And we work on that from the minute you walk in the door to the minute you walk into your house. It feels great to just have a house again, like have family time, like movie nights and stuff. My birthday's almost coming up and I want, I want them to come to my house. Um, I hope we can get a... A trampoline. A trampoline. Lexi, if you have one wish, what would you wish for? Mmm. Oh, house. The house. Now I get a house. What would your house look like? I don't know what it's gonna be, but I, I'm gonna decorate it like Elsa themed, and I'm gonna paint the wall blue. What I hope for is that 
Homelessness would be a word that doesn't exist anymore. What would you wish for? To mostly have a good home and not end up like this again. I hope you guys can make a thousand nearest places. We have seen our community stand up and bring more children inside, but we need more help. We can do this. Bring these families inside, keep them together. You can bring a child in tonight. It's up to our entire community to say, stop this crisis. We know we can do it. No child should have to sleep outside. They're amazing families and very resilient. And it's our job to keep their dreams alive. And you can tell they have dreams. They want an Elsa-themed room. They're so happy to have a bed and a blanket. They want to go to school. And we know that we can do that. And at Mary's Place, as you see, um, we have a community. We, our vision is a community where everybody has safety, stability, and, and housing. And we're on a path to do that with families. We simply believe that no one's child should have to sleep outside. Um, you know the crisis before us. Uh, to put it simply, for every $100 that rent goes up here, 15% of the people in the city will lose their address, will lose their home. It's about 32% of the people that live outside the city that will lose their home. They are simply not the safety net to be able to afford a rent increase. Um, you see the numbers, you hear the numbers from the one night count, there they are. Do you think that they're counting children from two to five in the morning? They're not out walking outside. Our children and our families are at the end of quiet cul-de-sacs, sleeping in cars, hoping not to be noticed. Most of them are in U-Hauls, because it's much cheaper now to rent a U-Haul than it is a hotel room. Or their public storage unit, where they're hoping not to be noticed. We can do something about that. There's over 2,300 children and families on a list that is identified as unsheltered, and we work every day to bring them inside. The average worker here has to earn over $26 an hour to be able to afford a two-bedroom apartment. We know those numbers, and we, we are still able to help families move forward. These are our neighbors. We like to think that everybody's moving here because we have such great services or it's such a great location. The answer is, is that these are our families. 94% are from Washington State. 83% lived in Seattle or King County before they lost their address. 70% um, of our families are working. They come to us with jobs. They are just doing everything they can to hold on to their job while they're trying to get their children to school or to daycare or to medical appointments. And so um, we're just trying to help them keep those jobs. And they're, they're our children's classmates. One in 10 students have experienced homelessness. It's a phenomenal number. When you know that they're, that's in Seattle, but there have been over 40,000 children counted just in last year's school year of children identified by their teachers as homeless. That is something we can do something about. And for our one moment in time count, I think it's important to note that we work with families every day, but 97% of them, this is one and done. They will experience homelessness once and they won't meet us again. This is one situation that they have gotten in, a rent increase, a divorce they didn't plan on, a sick child that they never dreamed would have cancer or dialysis or a baby that was born at 28 weeks that they never thought would happen to them. This is their crisis and they can't solve it by themselves. Many of us would have the resources to do that. We'd call on family, we'd call on friends, we'd borrow some money. We do whatever we needed to do, but our families just need a little extra help this one time. So what does Mary's Place do? We started as a Women's Day Center, which we still have our Women's Day Center, and it's, to us, it's near and dear to our heart. It informed how we operate, how we treat um, our guests. 
Um, our day center is still at 9th and Stewart. It's 20 years old and um, this year, and we are grateful for to be able to bring in 100 to 130 women every day to get meals, showers, laundry, but more importantly, to do what we started out doing. Our women told us 20 years ago, yes, basic needs are really nice and good, but I want to deal with the root causes of my homelessness. I want to deal with that grief that I have of losing my children. I want to deal with the pain of broken relationships and the pain of leaving my house. I want to deal with those things because those are at the root of what are keeping me stuck in this situation. I want to deal with the physical and sexual abuse I endured and don't have anywhere to go to talk about that. So 20 years ago, women came together very much like we do now and sat around the table. Actually, I bribed them with uh, pizza and pop at the time to come in and tell me what it is that a program would look like. And those programs remain very similar to where they are today. They wanted to be empowered. They wanted to be able to earn things and not for things to be given to them. Not to always be waiting for the handout of a shampoo and a conditioner and, um, and depends or a tampon or whatever else they needed. They wanted to earn those things, and so they started a, a, a point system where they go in and they clean the bathrooms. Everything that you would do at your own house, compost, trash, you'd help in the kitchen, you'd clean up, you'd make meals for your, your friends or your sisters, and that's exactly the model that they started 20 years ago that is in effect today at the day center that is still in effect at our family centers. But most importantly, they told us they wanted groups. And they wanted support groups, and they wanted groups where they could share and talk. They wanted a place that felt like a community center and not a shelter. And so we invited all of these partners of the community to come in. Mary's Place does nothing well by ourselves. We, we do not. It is all of our community that uh, rises up to help our neighbors. And so we invited in medical um, nurses that were off shift and provided medical care, which they still do. We invited people in to talk, uh, to offer classes on for support for physical and sexual abuse and to begin to talk about those things and to heal with those things and to begin to talk about how you failed as a parent or you felt you failed as a parent and you just can't get over it. And so we offered support groups for those. We offered groups on boundaries, groups on hearing no, groups on saying no. All of those things that made a difference in their lives and those are the groups that we continue to do today but we offer more groups like parenting classes, uh, dealing with those tough issues uh, for our families. Um, and so we do that now, but we've, we've grown since that one day center. We didn't start growing until about 2009. I will tell you, Mary's Place was always, I ran the day center for 10 years. Mary's Place was always open to seeing women with children and bringing in their kids, but very rarely did you ever see a child outside from 1999 to 2009. And it was in 2009, right when the recession hit here, that families and single moms for Mary's Place just kept coming out this rapid rate. And we didn't know what to do. We'd never done night shelter. I would have told you before that time, we won't ever do night shelter. We do day center services pretty good. We're gonna stick with that. And everybody else does night shelter. But we went in 2009 and we asked the city to help us with an extreme winter shelter. At that point in time, if you were to bring your child into a shelter, the direction was that you were to call CPS in the morning. <laughs> and so we went to them and we said, hey, we, we've got to do something just for families. Uh, these are really good people. These are people that love their children and they're asking for help. And there was no money. There was no money at that time to open anything. And they're like, but if you want to do something, we want you to do something. And so we're like, how, how could you not? I had 20 moms, 40 kids a day in the shelter on top of 130 women in a 5,000 square foot space right on Third and Bell where we still are. And we could not say no. Uh, and so I went to our board and said, we have to do something. I don't know what it looks like, but we've got to try. And at that time, so we reached out to the faith community. We had a large faith connection and we just started sheltering families in the basement of churches because they had space at night and there was nobody there. So we had, we borrowed a van, it was 15 passengers. So we took 14 moms and 14, 14 moms and kids. Some nights it was seven moms with seven babies and other nights it could have been two families with a lot of kids. 
Uh, but they were sheltering them in the churches. The churches were providing all the volunteer support, all the meals, everything. And that went on for eight years. But during that time, as things started to grow and progress, we got a home. We moved our day center space to Ninth and Stewart, and that opened up the building on Third and Bell. And the landlord said, we love having you here. Don't you want to stay? Um, and we were like, yeah, we want to stay, but we really need to do night shelter. And she's like, OK, you could do that. So that started us on this journey of identifying underutilized buildings. That This building was uh, really slated for demolition. Uh, it's an unreinforced masonry building that nobody wants anybody to sleep in. But um, we were able to, to move in there. We had to do some seismic upgrades, which uh, CPL came and did for free. We had a lot of pro bono support. And that was the first time that we opened a building that was slated for demolition and turned it into shelter and called it home for now. And here we are all these years later, uh, 10 years, or gosh, 2010, so nine years later, we're still in that building. 48 women and children have found refuge there every night of the week since that time. We haven't closed for one day. Um, and that started us on a path where we now have four permanent homes that are 24-7. Uh, and Mary's Place is looking to solve this crisis in King County. We want, we believe with a 1.8% vacancy, 1 vacancy rate, the high cost of living, high cost of rent, if we can get a model that works and we're not leaving children outside, then we have something that we can share. And so we have now been in 18 different buildings slated for demolition, uh, been able to turn them around, and right now we have nine. We're opening up a 10th one at the end of the month, right up on Aurora. And uh, so we're in, we, as far north we go, we go to Kenmore. We're in a former sheriff station that sat vacant for five years. We're in a little restaurant in the Shoreline neighborhood that serves 40 moms and kids. Uh, we are in a bank building in North Seattle, given to us by the city of Seattle, that serves 100, that sleeps 100, but serves 200 family members there during the day. We are um, in a former health department in White Center. We're in a church up in Madrona. Uh, that, so all of these total, we, we have 610 beds when we open here on Aurora. We'll add another 50 beds. We are looking to go into um, Amazon building, uh, which we're grateful for. I don't know if you know, but we'll be moving in with Amazon uh, right up here on 7th and Blanchard in the first quarter of 2020. It'll be eight floors, and we'll increase our beds uh, significantly, uh, inching us even closer to that goal of no child sleeps outside. So that should be about an additional 250 beds on site. It's the first time ever that um, there's been a shelter inside a corporate headquarters um, that was built for um, families experiencing homelessness that we know of. So we're very excited and very grateful for that project. We've also been in two other Amazon buildings. Uh, we were in the Travel Lodge that was at 8th and Blanchard, and then we moved to the Days Inn that they bought at 7th and Blanchard, and as those were taken down, uh, we moved to other sites um, in different neighborhoods. Uh, but at all of our sites, um, we have all of the same things I mentioned before, 40 plus social service providers come in and provide those services on site every month. Um, two, our three unique programs that we like, I'd like to talk about is Popsicle Place. All of our programs were, have been started and identified by the need that families or women have brought to us. Um, two years ago, when we were living in the Travel Lodge um, at, Seventh or 8th and Blanchard, uh, the first two people to arrive. One was Gio. He's six years old with his mom. And we learned that he was waiting for his seventh heart surgery. And we had no idea that there were medically fragile children outside. I, I, I was, so this happened two years ago. I was like, I just could not believe that. What? You need surgery? You've been sleeping in your car? She goes, hey, I did everything I could. I, had, I gave up my 401k, I gave up my vacation, my sick pay, but my kid needs a miracle, you know? And I, he has 22 doctor's appointments a month, and he keeps getting sick, and we keep going back to the hospital, and I want to be the one with him. And then she said to me, and you think we're the only ones? There's car camps of us. Children waiting for dialysis. More children on feeding tubes than you can know. 
She goes, we all need help. And so that started us on a path to say, what can we do better or different, and who else can we partner with? And so we went to Children's and said, what can we do? And they're like, we need help. We'd be happy to do that. So we worked together, and we set aside rooms. We said to Amazon, do you mind if we set aside this wing? And they're like, no, nope, you do whatever you need to do and whoever you need to serve. So since that time, we've brought in 50 Popsicle Place families. And as we move into the Amazon building, we will have space for 32 more families at one time. So that will give us a total of 45 rooms um, to serve children with medically fragile needs. And since that time, we've also taken in, which is heart-wrenching to me, uh, children on hospice. Um, it's one thing to go live in your car. When you're stuffed as a kid to go die in your car, there, there is something wrong with that. And that is something that I think we can easily fix in this community. The other program we have is Baby's Best Start. Um, do you know the one requirement? There's two, really. Two requirements to take your kid home from the hospital when they're born. Car seat, right? Everybody knows you got to have a car seat. Uh, the other is access to running water. And so we have running water. Uh, and many families, uh, their living situation changes. Uh, they're not allowed to go back to where they were living. Family doesn't want you after you have the baby, or you were living in a single adult um, building and you can't take a child there. And so at Mary's Place, we just work with area hospitals and are able to bring moms in when they're pregnant uh, or uh, when they've delivered. And last year we had 88 babies from zero to three months. So. And we move them all into housing, but our goal is to make sure those moms have a maternity leave. You can bond with your baby, have adequate nutrition, make sure you're getting adequate sleep, and really just work on housing. And then the other thing we have is our kids club, which is exciting space and very fun and very active. You have to know that 60% of our guests are uh, pretty much under the age of 13. Um, and uh, the, so we have... And we serve families, kids all up to all ages. If you're 18 still going to school, if you're an adult child with a parent that has special needs, we, you, you're welcome to. We, do, we serve all families that we possibly can. Um, and so at Kids Club, it's open in the mornings for early childhood learning, and then we open in the afternoon so our parents can keep working. It's a drop-in center, basically. It's our own boys and girls club kind of model. And, uh, they're, we're open from 3 to 7, and we have scouting trips, and we have homework time. You heard the kids on the video talk about that. It's a really big deal to have, a, to have an Xbox and uh, to sit down and play with when you've left all of that stuff behind, if you ever had that. And it's time for a kid to be a kid and to live their dream. So we are grateful for kids' clubs. And then Mary's Place also operates the community intake line. So every family has to call for shelter, and we're in a little drive through at that bank I told you about in North Seattle. We tried to sleep in the, um, in the drive through window area. We had a mom and a baby in there, but the fire department didn't like that. So we ended up moving in the county intake line. We took about, we did it last year. It was our first year running that. Um, and we took over, about, we took about 4,000 calls. We now know where every family's calling from. But the beauty of taking over that line is we also know who's sitting on a housing resource, who we can help. And so, uh, that maybe isn't lucky enough to win the lotto and get the ticket for shelter tonight. Um, because we know we're turning away between 10 and 25 families every night that there's just simply aren't enough beds. So we actually deploy diversion specialists and diversion specialists go out and meet with our families right where they are. So when you talk to those kids and you saw them on the video and Khalid said he's washing up at the grocery store before he goes to school, he's at Safeway across from Roosevelt High School. He's over there washing up, brushing his teeth because he doesn't want to smell and have be made fun of. And while he's doing that, we're talking to mom. And we're asking mom, what will it take to move you into housing today? And we're working with families uh, to get them in as quickly as possible, moving them from their cars actually into permanent housing. The first year we did it in 2017, we moved 121 families. And last year, I think it was about 293 or 295 families directly from cars to permanent housing. And we're on a path to really break those records. Uh, we moved 175 families in the first three months of this year directly from cars into, into permanent housing. 
it goes to show you that families are working, they have resources, they can income qualify, but they are just saving or need a little bit more, or they need a connection to a landlord. And so that's what diversion is all about. We have locators that go out and work in the community, and last year they just went and shook 600 landlords' hands. Every time you see a for rent sign, every uh, nonprofit housing provider, anywhere they could go, low, um, low income housing, they're out meeting people, talking to people, trying to work um, up an agreement with landlords that they will take our families, that just let us know that you have an opening because we're going to refer families to you. And we have a landlord mitigation fund where we have set aside $100,000. If something goes wrong in your unit, you can apply uh, for this funding as long as you bring another Mary's Place family inside if the family needs to leave. And we've had that money for two years. We've used it twice for about a total of $3,500, uh, one for a plumbing fee and one for a carpet cleaning thing that they wanted done. But it just goes to show you these are good families, capable families. Landlords just need that reassurance that we're there. And on top of that, we provide stabilization support. So families can call us anytime they're struggling and the landlord can call. We have a 24 seven hotline that they can call and say, hey, I'm, I'm having a problem. This guest, this tenant is not recycling. That cost me 70 bucks. Extra bags that they put out. They put them in the garbage and they didn't recycle. We're like, no problem. We'll go out and do a recycling class. And we do that. Landlords happy, tenants happy. They just didn't know, right? It wasn't something they had to do where they were before. So those are some of our programs. Um, and then I can just show you, these are our numbers. If you're a numbers person, uh, we're just really simply scaling up to meet the need, right? 7,000 bed nights in 2012, 179,000 bed nights. Again, all in underutilized buildings. Scaling up our meal program but still keeping our costs extremely low with a food recovery program. We're out every night, our trucks are out, a gift from Boeing, uh, Employees Community Fund, our trucks are out every night picking up food from Amazon Go, Starbucks, food that was made today, donated tonight, is in our guest hands in the morning. Uh, they can take those sandwiches to work or to school. They eat right there and the yogurt and the bananas and the fresh fruit and it's incredibly nutritious food. It's really changed the quality of the food that we're serving. And then we also supply hot meals at night. So uh, you can see volunteer hours, um, families move to stable housing, um, incredible support from our community to make all that possible. It's not just Mary's Place. And then um, I think for some of you, I know you might be interested in developing shelter. And we have our tax assessor, I don't know if you know John Arthur Wilson, but he's here tonight and we love, and he's been so supportive in helping us identify buildings. Uh, we often lose a building quickly. We don't know it's gonna be sold or transformed or demolished. Uh, we try to learn within 60 days, but he's been instrumental in helping us identify buildings. Um, whenever we call, he's amazing. And so our big thing is to, uh, we have a site selection committee that's always working. We have just um, volunteers in the community from land use attorneys to architects that are designing our spaces to commercial realtors to property developers to construction teams that are just volunteer to help. And so uh, we meet monthly and we're always identifying a need. I'll tell you right now, we're looking for cold storage for all that food we're picking up. We're getting so much food, we wanna be able to save it. Sometimes somebody will call and say, I got a pallet of chicken, do you have space? And we're like, not today. So we're looking for cold storage, places to sort that food so we can share it with our community. Um, but we always are looking for underutilized buildings. I've talked to you about something that's slated for demolition. We're working on developing relationships with landlords. If anybody knows anybody, we're always trying to shake hands and uh, really, if it's one unit, that's great. Sometimes it's five units, sometimes it turns into 200 units. You just never know uh, who you're talking with and, and um, once they get an experience of working with our families, they really are transformed um, and wanting to do more. But um, some of the things I can tell you, lessons learned. Uh, we learned a lot in, uh, we never had ran overnight shelter, we never, were property managers or any of that before. Um, and so we start with the right team and that's building out this site selection team and people that can identify property and have great connections and that are willing to come alongside their neighbors and help us. 
uh, and with land use attorneys and all of that, we've learned a lot in having to change use of buildings down here in Seattle to make sure that they um, are able to be utilized for shelter. That is a challenge outside of the city of Seattle. I will tell you there aren't really codes to exist for shelter. Most cities do not have them. And so we're always working with cities to try to transform those to be able to open the shelter to begin with. Um, so we always are looking at site requirements. Um, when, we let, when we want to put a shelter somewhere, really on the bus line is critical. Remember the running water? We gotta make sure we have water and heat in those buildings. Uh, we're, we often, are, um, our community partners will help us put in showers or laundry, which we just did. Uh, but if you have the space for those things and those work out, that works out great. Uh, but other than that, we don't really need a lot of cooking facilities or any of those in buildings. Um, we try to do a minimum of 5,000 square feet um, in our building right over here on Bell Town. It's 5,000 square feet, but it, it sleeps 48 people. It's pretty amazing. 48 moms and kids every night. Um, we work with, right from the get-go, um, our architects go into the building uh, and help us design the space, help us decide how many beds we can get in there. Really, egress is a really big part of making sure we can get in and out. And then right at the start, we invite um, SDCI, uh, Department of Construction and Inspections, to come in with the fire department and say, is, is this gonna work? Uh, we give them the plans that we have because we want to expedite the process as quickly as possible. We've been known to get a permit in less than eight days, um, or eight days, I think is our shortest, is our, is our record. Um, but generally it takes uh, two to three weeks if we have all of the steps in place, which is phenomenal in this city, and that's why it works. Because other people are waiting much longer for a building permit, and when you're able to move in and call it home for now, for 18 months until they get their permit, that is where the life-saving work starts. And landlords love having us in there. Um, no one's gonna squat in your building. They're not gonna be vandalized. We've changed um, doorways that were number one crack-smoking doorways, but once, I guarantee you, once you bring in a mama bear and her little ones, that's not happening anymore. Um, and we're there, and we keep, uh, Mary's Place maintains, will maintain the outside of the building. If it gets tagged, we're, we're painting it over as quickly as possible because we're there all the time, right? Uh, and so, and landlords feel really good about using their buildings to save lives. Where would these children and parents be without, without their building? We know where they are, and it's scary. So it's a win-win for both. Um, Developing community partnerships has been key, right? We can't afford to go in and put money into a building that was gonna be torn down, and that's not what we wanna do. That is not the best use of anybody's money, and we wanna be good stewards of everybody's money. And so our community partners come in, they donate paint, this building up on Aurora, I was amazed. They brought in all this paint, they put it into a big, big old bucket, and it's like the most beautiful color. Like you never, it, it's a nice light gray, I was like, and it looks beautiful. But it's things like that where people have leftover supplies, whether it's a window, uh, somebody donated a whole bunch of laminate uh, plank flooring for our Marion site, which is beautiful. Uh, but it's asking people in what they have. Fort Lewis McCord had three ADA shower stalls. We're like, perfect, fits, build out that. They make them fit. So those things um, are important to us. Bigger companies come in, McKinstry comes in, does all the electrical and things like that. It's just asking for help. And in a time when all of these companies are backed up and backlogged, it's amazing how they sacrifice and make the time to get these shelters done. They'll be there at night, they'll be there on weekends. Uh, they care about our community, they love their neighbors, and everybody wants to help, they just, not everybody knows how. Um, and then it's trying to develop an ongoing relationship with the neighbors, right? That's why it works, you have to be good neighbors. You have to be able to allow people to call you, you have to be able to hear the, you know, the story of somebody's throwing trash in my yard or parking in front of my mailbox and those type of things, and we want to deal with those. So we always try to have uh, good neighbor uh, relations, but we also hold quarterly meetings at all of our neighborhoods. And come talk to us. We'll tell you what's going on. We'll tell you where Sally and, and Jimmy moved to. 
We'll, um, but we'll also want to hear the complaints all the time because we, if we, if we're going to be good neighbors, we have to be able to hear those things. Um, let me see. So where do we want to go? Uh, really, our goal is no child sleeps outside, and we really believe we're on a path to do that. By running that county intake line, we see that there's, uh, out of all the families, the 4,000 families that called, we were able to shelter 41% of them with all of the um, county providers. There's only six people that do emergency, six organizations that do emergency shelter, and we all work together, and we work together every night to fill every bed every night. So we know we have a little ways to go, but if you, if the math pans out that we're, go, we're gonna inch so much closer when we add those 250 beds. Uh, so we'll see where we get, but we're inching closer to that dream. Uh, we have a piece of property in Burien. We bought our first home in Burien. Why did we buy in Burien? Because most of our families are all coming from down south. When we track where they're calling from, Federal Way, Kent, Auburn, and Burien constantly come to the top of the list, which makes a lot of sense because we serve a lot of families ex uh, living in poverty. And when that rent increase went up, they just couldn't afford it. And so that's why we wanted a South End hub. And so we bought a piece of property on 4.3 acres, and it's an old former hospital. Um, and it is phenomenal. And that's where we have Popsicle Place now. Those hospital rooms are perfect. They're all different sizes. We have a healthcare clinic. When you drive up, it's got a stand, volleyball court, and a a basketball hoop and a hopscotch um, and so we're putting in a playground but um, that we would like to see affordable housing on and we want to do some more prevention work it's one thing to keep pulling people out of the stream uh, because they're drowning and they're so scared and they have nowhere to go tonight but how can you prevent that from the beginning there's a lot of prevention work that can be done in this community and we're just now starting to get there. But you have to have an adequate crisis response system in order to start an adequate prevention system. So that's why we were stuck in the crisis response mode, but there's a lot of organizations that do amazing work. Um, the county has taken the lead on some prevention work, so uh, that's pretty amazing. And although hunger is important, it, um, and there's a lot of agencies that deal with that. We just want to make sure that the families we're serving, that they are not going hungry and that we can bring them inside. And we're looking to scale the food recovery program I talked to you about with other partners in the community. Um, but lots of ways you can help, but I really like to answer um, questions that you may have. I've talked way too much. So, yes. Uh, for the prevention you mentioned, this in terms of where you want to go, does that include uh, political advocacy for ending the root causes of, systemic root causes of homelessness as well? We always are talking about advocacy um, more in terms of resources that are needed, so more for affordable housing, yes, the root causes. Uh, right now, we're, you know, child care is a really big um, issue that, and especially for medically fragile children, I, I don't know that you can find, we have one provider down in Federal Way that'll take a child with medically fragile needs. Um, and so we're always, it just depends what topic that we're on, but we're advocating for resources for that. But yes, the root causes of that. Do we all think that there needs to be more mental health care support, behavioral health support? Yes, yes. And what can we do to offer those? Many, many providers are working to offer all of those things on site. Uh, Mary's Place is one of those, and partner with other people to offer those. I guess my question is more, does it extend to actual like legislative advocacy as well? We do. We have an advocacy team that is much like the site selection team that, that's working on those pieces and always getting involved in what legislation is right for the groups that we're working with, and there are a lot of political action agencies that do that on SARS homelessness and let you know, and there's a lot of those that do that on hunger, right? Northwest Harvest Food Lifeline are great on the political advocacy part for hunger, and there's a lot that do the homelessness causes. Um, Mary's Place is not as robust in that, um, so looking to get more into that, that's why we're starting this political advocacy group. Other questions? Ask me anything. Yeah. I'm from the east side, I do things with the social concerns council over there, and some of you have the shelters and everything there. So looking, you have, there's nothing on the east side that Mary's Place is working with, right? Because they um, cover around pretty much.
talked about, we do, uh, a lot of groups do supply things to Mary's place. So I'm trying to kind of figure out the relationship to the east side as well. So, yeah, there's some great organizations already doing great work there. So you want to go, Mary's Place tends to go where there's large gaps in services. Um, Catholic Community Services does an amazing job over there. Sophia's Way, Bethlehem House that they just opened and the day center there. Uh, down and then in Renton, uh, you've got Reach and there's a couple other family shelter service providers. So yeah, if, if we could be of help or we thought that was where we go, our, our funds are extremely limited. And our costs are not in the buildings and as such as they are in operations. We have over 200 staff now, and just trying to keep staffed up when you're 24-7, that, that prevents us from going everywhere we want to go. If we had a dream, we'd be like Jorge, remember? I wish there was a thousand various places. And that meant that we would be in every community, that there would be a shelter, not a Mary's Place, but a shelter in every community, so when you lost your address in your community, you still would have your community to love you and to support you. Most people want to go back and live in the same community they left. Yeah. So, yeah, good, good partners, great partners over there. Yes? Um, you said there were six other organizations that did emergency shelter. Is that just for families, or is that? Yeah, for families, okay, yeah. Six yeah. Uh, we tend to break ourselves and kind of silo ourselves in, in trying to solve the root causes of, of where you are. And there's, so there's families, there's single adults, there's youth, there's veterans that do a lot of work, and then there's domestic violence, and then there's seniors. So those are kind of the groups that, that operate. Okay. Yes? Is there any particular reason you started working with families as opposed to single adults and so on? Yeah, but because they came to us looking for help and there wasn't anything um, to offer them. So that's pretty much why we still serve our single women. And um, as hard as it is not to do shelter for single women because they need it too, at the time there was enough beds for single women. When we started this family, uh, family evening shelter, overnight shelter, but um, that's not so anymore. There, there aren't enough for single women. We'd, we'd like to, we have to do solve one first and work on that. Uh, we know our dreams are big, but we've got to stay focused on one mission. Do you uh, offer mental health and addiction counseling through your facility, within the facilities? Yeah, um, so we partner. Again, like I said, we don't do anything well by ourselves. At all of our sites, we have partners, whether it's the Center for Human Services out in the North End, it's Novos down in the South End. They come in and provide on-site services. And the goal is to get families connected right away, to make sure that they have the um, medical benefits to cover those things that should they need them, but have the resources right on site. Uh, but our families stay about an average of 90 days. And so, and although 90 days is helpful, it's, it's not the end all to, to be able to deal with your crisis. We want to make sure you're well connected in your community when you leave us. We do a lot of infant um, maternal bonding programs that follow families for a year. Uh, into their home to work with those families to make ensuring success uh, with those that mom and that baby. We have a lot of behavioral health, our behavioral concerns with kids that that bubble up in shelter. Uh, things like bedwetting starts again, uh, night terrors start, um, and so we're able to bring uh, folks inside to help uh, work and navigate those situations with uh, with the parents, do parenting, do coaching things like that, uh, but it's parents, it's depression. I mean, there, I don't know any um, parent that hasn't experienced some sort of depression. Uh, there's a lot of PTSD. We serve a lot of refugee and immigrant families, probably about 30%, and uh, just what they've done to get here to this country has um, sometimes is just heart-wrenching when you think of leaving husbands or children behind when you were separated in a war-torn country or in a refugee camp and here you end up coming here, you don't speak the language, you were invited to come here, you're our newest Americans, and yet you have, you know what the subsidy is for refugee resettlement? $1,500. You gonna make that work for how long? So we essentially set them up to experience homelessness. So you track numbers of ethnicities and um, countries that we're going to come from? 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we do our best. Yeah, demographics are out there of who we serve, who who isn't being served. That's the big piece that we want to know. So we're always delving into who are we not able to serve and why is that? Seventy percent of our guests are people of color. Yeah, thirty percent of our refugees are no seventy percent of our refugees come from East Africa. So always looking at that. Uh, the Native American population is probably the least served in this community. And so really working on that, and so we've partnered with Chief Seattle Club to make sure that we hired our, uh, an outreach worker from Chief Seattle Club to work with our families and to train our staff to be culturally competent. Why aren't Native families feeling comfortable in shelter? Why are they leaving? What can we do better or different? So those are things that we're always looking at and tracking, it's important to us. Yeah. So is Mary's Place hiring? Hiring? Every minute, every day. It's really hard to keep 200 staff working in shelter. Uh, as you know, pay is what it is, and um, that breaks my heart when you see $26 for to be able to afford a two-bedroom apartment, because that's not what we pay either. And so we do the very best we can, but I tell people all the time, I don't think anybody woke up and said, I'm going to work overnights for the rest of my life. Uh, because having overnight staff and enough of them at your shelters is probably the hardest to fill. But from cooks to floor staff to housing managers to diversion specialists that are going out and meeting people in the community, we need all of that. So, yes? I notice that you've got resume help and mock uh, job interviews. Yeah. Do you have like computers set up so that people can? create their resumes and have them printed off? I mean, how does that all work? Yes, we have computers at each site. We also partner with over 50 corporations that hire directly out of Mary's Place. These corporations don't care what our family's address is. They just, and they don't care what their income is, they just know that they want to help our families be financially stable. So from Home Depot to Lowe's to the restaurants down, restaurants all over to the hospitals to um, hotels, to Amazon, Starbucks, you name it, they want to hire families. And so they hire directly out of Mary's Place, so we just have to give a warm handoff, but we want to make sure they have cover letters and resumes and go through mock job interviews so that they feel confident. Um, a lot of the women we see are domestic violence victims. So, you know, when you've been told you're ugly, fat, stupid, and you'll never amount to anything, and you begin to believe that, and you end up leaving that partner and fleeing, uh, it's really hard to believe that anybody would hire you. And so we work on a lot of those things, and so that's a lot of the practice that we go through. We have an internship program in our kitchens where we can hire our guests to build that confidence. We pay them $15 an hour to work in the kitchen, but we just are helping them build those, that skill set and that confidence to know that they can do it and then transition to a full-time job. Yeah? better ways or additional ways to help find empty buildings. I'm just wondering, like, do you have like a couple that are like, on the burner that you know that if you have to move or you say we need a building for a year, you know that the, uh, it will, will be available that long? How do you how do you work that? Because you know people working in creating buildings, there are ones around. And do you have a lot of connections in? You know, kind of have the best. <laughs> Tax assessor knows buildings everywhere. We do. We try to put the word out there. We have it always asking on our website, always asking, and every time I go out, connections to empty buildings and, and to landlords is the two things that I always push. Um, but um, yes, yeah, so we're always we generally know when our lease is going to be up, um, or we always have a 60-day kickout clause. Somebody has to give us 60 days notice, which isn't a whole lot when you're trying to move a shelter. Uh, but we do the best we can. But um, a lot of it comes with having to have the operations money. Yeah, but I can't go buy an empty building without thinking, oh my goodness, how many people could we put in there? You see that Albertsons closed? Do you see the Safeway closed? Do you see Sam's Club was vacant for how long? Still is? Do you know, how many people can get Sam's Club? They got a bakery, you know they got lots of bathrooms. You're like, you can put a basketball court in there for kids. You can do a whole lot with that. So I can't help myself when I drive by those buildings, but a lot of our site selection committee, our board members, uh, 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 John Arthur Wilson. and I drive together. Yeah. <laughs> so we're getting connected.
directions that people are giving you are giving you buildings all the time. The rent has to be right for Mary's Place, which is pretty much none. Um, and although we're in a, we have rent of a dollar a month at a lot of sites, which is which is great. Twelve dollars, and you can bring all these people in for a whole year. Uh, so, but the rent, and then we have to really know about the utility piece. We pay utilities at most of our buildings, and some of them are quite expensive. So, yeah. Thanks for asking. You can always tell us if you see one, too. Um, yeah. I'm curious, the families that do move into housing, is that typically Section 8 that they move no. into? No. Majority of time, it's not. Uh, these are all usually market rate landlords that were moving families into or some affordable housing. We move a large portion, not a large, I would say, um, I don't know, about 10%, maybe of our families go to transitional housing. And those are typically more refugee or immigrant um, families as they're waiting to scale up and get language skills and language capacity and all of that and work history. Um, but the rest are, you're required as a provider to develop those relationships and to find that funding to help families move in. So it's a lot of work. Do you subsidize rent? Anything? We don't subsidize rent, but we pay first, last down. We pay screening fees. We, uh, within 48 hours, every family better have their birth certificates ordered and their ID on track because when your housing solution comes, you gotta have those. So we are doing those things from the get-go. From the moment you get in, we're addressing those barriers. What are the barriers that brought you here? Everybody got something. So nothing's too big, too ugly, too yucky, too little to talk about. So let's talk about what those are. We help families negotiate down um, their housing debt. If, if they left uh, owing money, we can get that down. We um, unfortunately or fortunately become really good at that piece. And so we work with a lot of partners in the community to pay down that debt, to pay the first, last, and down. Uh, we work with the city, provides all of that diversion funding I told you about. Uh, we get about, it's about a $600,000 contract, but it's about $1,900 to move a family in. That's a lot of families as you're, as you're moving them in each year. So that's where that, the bulk of that funding comes from. But I'll tell you, it was Mary's Place that piloted that program that proves that it works. And that's one of the things Mary's Place is, is good at because we have a lot of private money. 15% of our money just comes from government funding. The rest comes from philanthropy, corporations, congregations, individuals, grants. Um, and so we pilot things. And we piloted that diversion where we said, you know what, diversion can work. You just need to go where people are. Families are hiding. They don't want to be found. They're afraid you're going to take their kids. I would be. I, I, if you feel like you fail as a parent because you can't provide, everybody understands the word neglect. It's not that you're neglecting them, and it's not that CPS wants to take them from you. They want to keep you together. We just got to have enough shelter space to bring you in. And so we go to those families, and that's why diversion works. We're out looking for you. We care about you. We love you. We want to help you. Here's what we can do. Here's what we can offer. And so. Uh, the Section 8 vouchers, few and far between, but a lot of families, as you know, as you may know, 40% of vouchers are turned back in or renewed because they're just looking for that landlord connection. So then I go back to that landlord piece, we have those connections. So that's why we're successful in that because we can make the, the, the match, right? Most families are in their car because they're waiting for that last month. I got to pay, the, I got to just get enough, I got to save enough, got to save enough to get the, to be able to pay the security deposit or whatever it is. So. That's funny, but United Way is great at paying a lot of those fees for us. Um, a lot of our uh, corporate partners, Starbucks has been phenomenal in raising money for diversion, for uh, and client assistance in the Schultz Family Foundation. They provide, it's hard to get money to move people out of shelter. Um, and so those are the foundations that I pick that up and phenomenal support. I think I probably talked your ears off, yes. Pay through the city, we've heard through a lot of shelter providers that uh, just the lack of affordable housing out there makes it really hard to move people out of shelter and into housing. Um, and that the kind of requirement that the, the metric that your performance be based on that metric alone is kind of unfair to some providers. It sounds like you guys have a lot of private funding, so maybe that's not. No, nope, we're in that boat too. Okay. Um, we have one shelter that is city funded, the rest of ours are privately funded. And we did it intentionally to get a seat at the table to help create the systems reform changes that were needed. We were sitting on lists of 
5,000 family members that were two years old that the only way they could get a referral was through a phone call and yet those phone calls were out of date. So sometimes that forced, forced your beds to be vacant because the county couldn't give you the referral fast enough. So they reformed that system, but it's still not perfect. So now we have done it again and said it's gotta be in real time. You gotta have people that are on the list that called recently. And so um, we're working on those things, but the performance pay thing, it, it's challenging. And I'll tell you, the standard for families is 65% exits to permanent housing. You cannot count transitional housing and 20% of the referrals you get are from the county and the only ones basically that we receive most of is transitional housing. So you can't count those towards your exit outcomes. I think if they could begin to look at that, for me, the way I look at it is, is that the city and the county declared a state of emergency. And if we're in a state of emergency, isn't a <coughs> more stable housing and secure housing a positive outcome? For me, it, it, it would be. Transitional housing is one to two years of guaranteed rent at 30% of your income. And if you pay zero, if you have zero income, you pay zero rent. So is that a positive housing outcome? I think so, but I don't get to choose. So for families, it's 65%. I think for singles, uh, it's 40% exits to permanent housing. So there's different standards. And then for youth, I think it's similar. 28% or something that have to move, which is harder population to move to permanent housing. So, um, but yes, it's a challenge, but we're up, but our goal is 100% of families to permanent housing, right? That's what we want. And that's what we want for our families. But yes, having the lack of affordable housing makes it more challenging, but we're gonna keep at it. We're not giving up. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, that's okay. I was wondering, what is your definition of Permanent housing, are those leases that you're going to get into, or are they like mortgages? Or? Yeah, it's leases, so for a certain period of time. So our definition of permanent housing is defined by your funder, right, that that's providing that, or the county, at, um, there's different governance systems, but wow, that's defined. Uh, for us, I think it's a six month, you have to have at least a six month lease that you've signed that you can move in, or a guaranteed uh, stable living situation if you're moving back with family. Uh, that you have to have a guaranteed time frame that you can live there with them. So, yeah. Yeah. So how do you keep track of these families that you get into permanent housing and know they're able to, you know, be able to afford their housing past that six months? Or? Yeah, and that's a challenge, right? Um, being able to keep track of everybody you serve. Mary's Place, uh, to be honest, we focus on the first 90 days because there's a gap in the amount of services that's available to families once they transition after the first 90 days. Um, and so you can't get assistance uh, too much before then. And that's when most of our families are really vulnerable, right? You've used everything to get into your house. Is this familiar to any of you? You saved your first, your last, you're down. You've used everything you can, and you're trying to buy cleaning supplies and paper bags, and you're trying to get your mattress or a couch or something to sit on, and everybody wants a TV, and. Uh, and so when you are strapped the most and then all of a sudden your kid gets sick and they have the flu so bad and now you've got to stay home for three days because you don't have child care to be with your kid and now that puts you $150 behind on your rent, now what are you going to do? And that's where a lot of prevention resources <coughs> come in. And so we can help for that first 90 days and, and, and bridge that gap and try to connect everybody to the resources that are existing and we can say to you, you know what, that 150 bucks, come on in, let's get you some diapers. Stop spending the money on the diapers, let's, let's, let's try something else. Or here, the, the, um, you know, this, this agency can help with this amount of money. Here, call the churches, they can help with this amount. But we try to piece everything together to keep you in your home. We follow up to about six months. We'd like to do longer, but it is, it is a daunting task to keep up with everybody. Yes. Did you find that the, um, the immigration issues that are going on that people are not that was there a decline for a while with people not wanting to come in because they didn't want to be identified as you know, um, you know the issues at the, the border and everything? Is I, for us, it, it's hard to tell because we only track who does come in or who we're working with outside. Mm -hmm. So 
I've heard that too, but I just, but for us it would be, we're still seeing families come in and fill our shelter beds every night. Any other questions? You guys are awesome. Thanks for being an amazing community. Thank you for being the grace and goodness that we need. You're here because you care. You're leaning into this crisis, and that is probably the greatest gift that you can give. And to be able to advocate for these families. They are hardworking, resilient families. They are children who are trying to graduate from high school at the end of, in June. They are toddlers that are taking their first steps. They are newborn babies that just need to bond with their parents. These are who we are seeing. They are love and they need to be loved and you are the ones that are doing that. So thank you for, for being the goodness and grace that we need so much.